Um, welcome, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming here, uh, and congratulations for finding the room, because it was not that easy, I think, for us at least. Um, uh, I'm Els Houtsmuller. I'm an associate director at PCORI in the Healthcare Delivery and Disparities Research Program, and um, what I'm going to do is um, just give you a very brief overview of PCORI's mental health portfolio, just, so, just to give a little bit of context to the things you will hear about today, because of course we're going to focus on serious mental illness, and um, th this is of course an extremely important topic given the, the enormous disparities that exist between um, patients with uh, serious mental illness and the general population. Actually, um, and they are so persistent across countries and across time and across, across healthcare systems that uh, there's now discussion of actually assigning uh, serious mental illness as a disparity, um, considering that a disparity. So it is, um, uh, the, the research that is being done is extremely important and we are very happy to have our panel here today who all will um, share something that we have three people who will share something about about their PCORI funded studies in this population um, and then we have also have a, um, a different stakeholder a payer stakeholder and I will introduce everybody as they start um, their presentation so you'll have to um, be in anticipation for a moment about what everybody's names are. Um, I have nothing to disclose. So as of uh, yesterday, um, PCORI has awarded more than $250 million for, um, to fund around 70 studies in mental health. Um, and that means that PCORI considers mental health an extremely important topic, and as you can see here, um, you should look at the, uh, the top part here and don't pay too much attention to the numbers which you may be able to decipher or not. What I want to show you is that uh, mental health, mental and behavioral health, is the largest category in terms of the studies that PCORI has funded. The stu uh, the, those studies really span the care continuum but are largely um, uh, focused on treatment and management. What you see here is that really the treatment and management studies are the, the major part, but we have also have a number of prevention and screening studies. The interventions that are being compared and evaluated in these studies are a whole range, but um, and they're listed here. Um, what I want to point out is just that community health workers, as you can see, is a um, um, an intervention that we know has a lot of evidence, and so there are many different studies that are employing community health workers in different ways and different organizations. Uh, the second largest category is, is uh, just a straightforward comparison of cognitive or behavioral, cognitive behavioral, um, and psychotherapies. And then there's also pharmacotherapy, and a fourth really large chunk is integration of care. So integrating mental health care into physical care, which is really what we're talking about today, improving the physical health of patients with serious mental illness. So what you see on this slide are um, a number of factors that are generally considered as predictors of high impact for studies. So um, we try to ensure that, PCORI, that every PCORI study is a high impact study by being able to check all these boxes about these different factors. So um, for the mental and behavioral health studies, I'm happy to say that 100% of course include patient-centered outcomes. We are the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, so it would be bad if that were not the case. 100% um, include um, patient and stakeholder engagement, which we consider a really important part of studies because that is how we can make sure that interventions, if they show to be um, effective, that they are actually used, disseminated, and, and scaled. 81% um, of the mental and behavioral health studies are uh, done in understudied populations. 
and the majority of them are randomized controlled trials, which are just considered the, the best design, the design that produces results that are the most reliable. 100% um, of Macquarie studies are head-to-head -head trials, comparing one intervention with another, comparing whether this works better, whether A works better than B, not just A is better than nothing, but of the things that are there, which one is better for which patients. And then about a third of the mental and behavioral health studies are large multi-site trials. And then um, to get to the sort of the point of this um, uh, session, these, this is a slide that just shows you the mental health studies by condition. And as you can see, the um, serious mental illness is the largest um, portion of studies that we funded. One out of four studies are um, in patients with serious mental illness. And with that, I would like to um, uh, ask the first speaker to come up. this work? Yes. Um, so our first speaker is James Schuster, who has been a Gory recipient uh, for um, several awards. He is Vice President of Behavioral Integration and Chief Medical Officer for Behavioral, Medicaid, and Special Needs Services at UPMC Insurance Services Division. He's board certified in psychiatry and in the subspecialties of geriatric and addiction psychiatry. Um, he leads a team, he leads several teams that have secured funding from PCORI and other sources for projects that are focused on in integrated care, shared decision making, and medication assisted treatment. He completed his residency at the University of Pittsburgh and also serves as a clinical professor of psychiatry at that institution. Please go ahead. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, I have nothing to disclose in terms of pharmaceutical or other conflicts. As uh, Dr. Hausmiller mentioned, I worked at the insurance division of UPMC, uh, which is the second largest provider-owned insurance entity in the country. Uh, Kaiser is the largest, and we've become the second largest. And I'm a as Dr. Hausmiller mentioned, I'm a psychiatrist by training, and we have a large behavioral health managed care organization that works with a lot of Medicaid members, about a million Medicaid members around the state. So that really drove a lot of our interest in this work. I'm going to try to touch on both uh, systemic challenges and opportunities to integrate uh, physical health services with behavioral health services, and in particular talk about some strategies that we implemented that uh, PCORI was kind enough to fund an evaluation of and talk briefly about the results from that. I want to talk about some of the barriers that exist in addressing physical health issues in individuals with serious mental illness, um, and then talk briefly about our findings and our efforts to uh, generalize the, our work in other settings. So some of the challenges faced by uh, community mental health centers and really other community mental health uh, or behavioral health providers. Uh, one is that if you've ever worked in a community mental health setting, you know there are many limitations, both financially and in terms of personnel. A lot of the agencies are really very fragile financially. Uh, people who work in behavioral health aren't particularly, generally aren't particularly well paid, so there's definitely uh, turnover and hard for uh, these agencies to recruit staff. And then there are some policy barriers as well uh, the mental health services typically grew up separate from general medical care, and so there are a lot of policies that grew up tied to that fact, thinking that the mental health practitioners would focus on mental health problems, that physical health issues would be addressed in general health care setting. However, despite that, uh, mental health centers are often the only point of contact with the healthcare system for individuals with serious mental illness. And especially, they're often the only community-based service that they have regular contact with. So individuals with serious mental illness often use inpatient services, um, other intensive levels of care, but tend to not necessarily see their primary care physician or get preventive services done. 
Um, and which is not good because individuals with serious mental illness, as you all know, are at risk of many physical health problems, um, often driven uh, initially by smoking or other tobacco use or obesity. Um, and because of that, their lifespans are often significantly shorter than the general health population. Um, so we really felt, and the providers actually came to us initially and raised this question. They said, you know, our, our patients have all these physical health problems. We really need some strategies to help engage them in understanding them and addressing them. So we really worked with providers and patients to build this model. Um, I mentioned already that uh, tobacco use and obesity are related to individuals' challenges with uh, serious mental illness, with physical health illness. There are also issues with access to care, and it's not necessarily literal access to care, but it's more practical access to care. Um, often people with serious mental illness may not be comfortable in primary care settings, and some primary care practitioners aren't all that comfortable with people who have persistent uh, Ill mental health issues or substance use issues, especially psychotic disorders. So those, uh, those arenas aren't necessarily welcoming. Um, so again, individuals with serious mental illness often use many medical services, but not necessarily preventive care. And traditionally, behavioral health providers aren't really trained in physical health issues. So the strategies that we use, one, and I will talk briefly about them, one was really several uh, activities designed to try to increase the capacity and competency of the behavioral health system to engage and address physical health issues in people with serious mental illness. And we built the model based on evidence that was available. So there's not lots of evidence about what strategies work best to accomplish this goal. But there was some evidence that having a nurse in a behavioral health setting was helpful, uh, who was focused on physical health issues. Clearly, use of a registry is helpful with many um, disorders. Um, clearly, use of navigators has been proven to be helpful. And there's lots of evidence around use of self-management strategies. So we wrapped all those into the the work that we did. So we developed what we called a behavioral health home model, and it was back now in 2010, again, to really try to enhance the capacity of the behavioral health providers, uh, provide comprehensive care management, care coordination, and really link uh, patients to community resources. Uh, we initially did a couple of demonstration sites uh, with all of these uh, initiatives, all these strategies, and found that they were helpful. So we decided to propose to PCORI a study that would uh, test two versions of this model. Uh, both versions included training, um, training peers and case managers to work as wellness coaches who would be focused on engaging people around working with physical health problems, working those into their recovery plan, and so on. Um, and both used this, the registry. One of the strategies also used uh, placing a nurse in the mental health center who was focused on physical health issues and worked closely with the providers. Um, and the other used the self-management toolkits. So we used a cluster randomized design, uh, implemented 11 sites and studied it over two years. And you can see there what the inclusion criteria were. We collaborated, as I noted, with many stakeholders in building this. Um, and uh, well, I went the wrong way. And in um, implementing the uh, study, we found that there were uh, the barriers that I talked about early on really re came up as we were implementing the study. Um, two of the initial agencies that we'd identified for this withdrew because they had financial problems and they couldn't participate. There was staff turnover, including of the nurses at some of the agencies, so we had to work around that. Uh, there were some challenges in terms of engaging the behavioral health staff. They didn't necessarily see physical health issues as like part of their job. So after they got some training and we did a lot of engagement work with the staff, they, they're now really very enthusiastic about it, but that took a while. Um, and there's also typically mental health providers often can't bill for services that involve physical health diagnoses. So we came up with a value-based payment model that really wrapped this approach into some of the other services that uh, the agencies were providing to address that. Um, 
So we've worked to disseminate this uh, to uh, a number of uh, to a number of additional sites because we had really some very positive outcomes. Uh, where there was very rapid increase in patient activation and significant increase in patient activation using the patient activation as measured by the patient activation measure across sites. And there's a, a quite a bit of research that suggests that even a small change in the patient activation measure is correlated with significant downward trends in uh, utilization of uh, physical health services and cost of services. So we were very uh, rewarded to identify that. There was very significant increase in engagement in primary and specialty care um, in both arms of the study. And there was a small improvement in perceived mental health status. So we're now working to disseminate this. Again, we've disseminated to additional 43 community-based behavioral health providers. And we're working now, we uh, were pleased that PCORI gave us a dissemination award to work to adapt the model and implement it in two uh, additional types of providers. One is children's residential treatment providers, and we thought about them because there's a really high rate of obesity among children in residential settings. So we worked to modify that, and the main modification that we had to work on with that is that uh, if you're working with children, you want to make sure their parents or families are involved in the, in the process. So we made some changes to the program for that. And then we're also working to implement it in uh, opioid treatment programs and methadone agencies, agencies that treat folks with methadone and or suboxone, um, because those individuals often have frequent occurrence of concurrent hepatitis C, HIV, other medical problems. And the main adaptation that we've needed to make for that group is that services in those settings are typically delivered in group settings rather than individually. So we had to modify some of the materials and some of the approaches to work uh, within group settings. So those, the dissemination implementation work in these special populations is underway, and hopefully in the next year or so, we'll have some results uh, from that to share with you as well. So, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, the next, our next speaker is Sherelle Bellamy. Um, and Sherelle has experience as a service provider, community ed educator, an organizer, community and academic re researcher, and person in recovery. Her expertise includes developing and conducting community-based research in initiatives and involving and partnering with people living with mental illness, substance abuse, HIV, and experiences of incarceration. At the Yale Program for Recovery and Community Health, Bellamy provides instruction on peer curricula development and training based on our research and practice experience with people with lived experience who are employed as peer supporters, coaches, and mentors. She also provides evaluation of the effectiveness of peer support and research and training for the development of culturally responsive community-based interventions. And she will tell us some about that work. Welcome. Thank you, good afternoon. <clears throat> I have nothing, well, I have a lot to disclose, but <laughs> nothing related to this. Um, the, um, basically, the objectives of uh, my presentation are to identify ways to foster relationships and engage community and research activities, learn ways that partnership works, and describe ways partnership um, enhanced our research. So starting with the why, um, as my colleagues all know, um, people with serious mental illness are dying 25 years earlier than the rest of society. And our biggest question was, can we collectively figure out a way to do something about it? And starting with the why was um, uh, uh, an exercise that we actually did at every, um, every time we met with our research team. Um, it is important for us to hold on to the why. We uh, view the video on a TED Talk by Simon Sinek called um, Starting with the Why. Um, and it really talks about the importance of being able to hold on to the why. Why is it that you're passionate about this work in the first place? And what is it that drives you to do this work? Um, which was really important for us as a research team. And when times got you know, challenging, when we had disagreements, we were able to hold on to not only our individual whys, but to develop a collective why, a collective vision of this work. So our study um, was 
have various different components. Um, the first part used mixed methods to determine which pati patients choose to use which services and what are the short and longer term outcomes for patients in the wellness center, which is a co-located um, primary care center within the community mental health center, in our case in uh, New Haven, um, Connecticut. And that end was 786, so we had access to administrative data from um, that number. Um, and it's really interesting, I just have to inter interject here. Um, initially, we were only going to focus on that first part of this study, um, but it was because of our partnership with individuals with lived experience of um, mental illness that we decided to do something further. And their biggest question was, what happens to the people who do not want to use co-located co services? Um, what if they want to go somewhere else? Or what if they we're just not able to engage them? Um, and they were like, we just, we just cannot like have nothing for them. So the second thing we did was based on participant interviews, we identified the barriers and facilitators to um, access um, to healthcare, uh, service use, and, and using improvements on how to um, elicit changes for the um, wellness center itself. Um, we also interviewed about 40 individuals whose healthcare outcomes had not um, improved. And with those 40 interviews, as well as the assist assistance of my colleagues who are other people with lived experience, as well as my colleague Peggy Sporbrick from CSP um, New Jersey. Um, we developed a peer-led community-based intervention um, based on the eight dimensions of wellness. So this was our conceptual model, as you can see here, um, really trying to look at some of the lack of access issues, urban poverty, sort of the um, discrimination, sort of the social determinants, um, and those were the intervention components that we were studying. And so this is where the intervention that I'm going to talk about comes in, and that was the augmentation strategy to increase advocacy and self-care. Um, what was really interesting is that the intervention components of the study itself, while it did it best, the, the Wellness Center, to address um, urban, urban po poverty, stigma, discrimination, and social isolation, it actually did not um, really address those factors. And we wanted to make sure that whatever augmented strategy we proposed was able to um, really get at some of those um, concerns that our individuals um, experience, particularly in the city of New Haven. So as we all know, and as we've been hearing since you know, our time at this conference, um, patient engagement is critical. Um, and not only a patient engagement, um, patient leadership um, and, and research is critical to, um, to the work that we all should be doing. Um, benefits include um, facilitating empowerment, enhancing relevance, and generating novel research. But we also know that there are some challenges. Um, some of those challenges are pervasive fears and skepticism by, um, in the research community, even from some of the researchers that were at our table. Um, and also, it requires time and patience and guidance, um, particularly at the outset. Um, so much time that I think, you know, our program officers try to push us over and over again because we want, they wanted to make sure that we were meeting for Corey's deadlines, but also making sure that we had time to really engage the people that we were working with and that they understood what the research outcomes were and what the research was about. So we have patients involved, like I said, um, throughout the entire process. Um, Kimberly Guy and this gentleman Steve, they were involved um, as I was writing, we were writing the grants um, from day one, and they were the ones that pushed us to move in a, into a different direction. We hired three as patient co-researchers, two patient stakeholders, um, and I do wanna note that five of our research staff um, also self-disclose as people with lived experience of mental illness. Um, 
What was really critical to this process was that our patient partner, particularly um, Kim Guy, she was the one that convened the advisory board. She provided training to them on leadership and board participation. Um, her main comment was she wanted to make sure that people were not just there to be tokens. And that's what's typical of many advisory boards at community mental health centers. Um, the other thing that was really important was just that people were involved throughout all aspects of the research, even those on the advisory committee. They were involved in um, assisting with analysis and shadowing on fo focus groups, et cetera. And also I wanted to say that if it wasn't for our patient partners, we would not have even been able to get the individuals to come to our meet and greet to um, inform them about the intervention. Um, and that's because many of them were, several of them were people who don't leave their homes. And having that opportunity to sit down with the peer providers who were going to, going to run the intervention um, proved to be effective in getting them there. We developed a, um, an intervention that the peers called Harambe, which means we come together or let's pull together in Swahili. Um, because again, getting at this collective um, way of how can we figure this out as a community. And it's based on the eight dimensions of wellness developed by our colleague um, Peggy Sporbrick. They chose this because to them it's, it's, it's simple. It's if, we, if individuals are having all of these different challenges in life, um, why should they or why should they focus on their health outcomes when they have so many other things going on? And if we're able to assist them with all these other areas, perhaps we can also improve their health outcomes. So these were a few of the um, findings that we had. There were a decreased number of visits to the emergency room for those who were in the Harambe um, um, intervention, decreased alcohol use, and increased overall wellness across those eight dimensions. Um, there were also findings related to um, participants felt they had more input into their treatment and um, participants felt that they um, would choose their current outpa outpatient care if it were free um, and available. So to end, co-location and ev evidence-based practice alone did not show significant improvement in health indicators. However, as many of our advisors, um, advisory board uh, members have said, more time is needed. It took them almost a year just to even get an appointment, not at the wellness center, but to, uh, but to be referred to uh, practitioners outside of the wellness center. So more time is needed to better understand this and study it. Uh, the other thing is that a community-based uh, peer-led holistic health intervention on the eight dimensions has promise. Um, again, we only have preliminary findings, but we are excited to say that um, just recently we were um, awarded a R34 from NIMH to further study the target mechanisms of the intervention so that we can see what exactly is working. Is it the peer support? Is it something about the eight dimensions? Um, is it having, having it in a community setting? What, what exactly is working here? The other thing that we were able to do, which is not on the slide, is, um, and I'm thinking about, you know, else when you all presented earlier on the opioid um, crisis um, and having a serious opioid crisis in New Haven, um, we combined elements of the um, Harambe condition, um, the eight dimensions of wellness, and developed a faith-based intervention we call the Imani, Breakthrough, Imani Breakthrough Project, which is targeted toward um, people who are currently using opioids and takes place in four churches in the state of Connecticut. And, um, and we're really excited about that. Again, that's driven by a peer and also a church member. Um, and I can tell you that we just started our second cohort of that, and um, we can only get 40 people in each site. In our second week, we had 40 people, so it's already full. So again, peer um, leadership, peer involvement is what gets the people out. And, and you know, so I'm really encouraging all of you who haven't done this um, to really pull from the people who know the people to get them there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I had the good fortune of being the program officer for both Shirelle's and James's project. So 
um, I, I do know about the, <laughs> about the challenges of these projects. Um, but, but both uh, very successfully completed, so, and that was always the goal, of course. Um, our next speaker is Sonia Ballantyne. Um, Sonia was a patient co-investigator on a Eugene Washington PCORI Engagement Award on Community-Based Participatory Research, CBPR. She graduated from Georgia State um, with a bachelor's in finance, and she worked for several years in the bu business sector before being hospitalized and diagnosed with bipolar disorder in 2007. She leads a team of patients and providers in designing an interactive CBPR training manual and implementing two CBPR projects in Chicago. Her experience with CBPR began in 2012 with designing a peer navigator training manual to improve integrated care for homeless African Americans with serious mental illness in Chicago. Thank you so much. You're um, welcome, Sonia. That person sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Right? Yes. Oh, well, wow. that's what I've been saying. I have no conflicts of interest. Okay, so when we, um, we really want you all to understand and be able to communicate the findings of this research and to, to be able to really appreciate uh, peer navigation services. This is one person helping another that comes from the same background, and in many instances, this will be their first time coming back into the work world. And so having that support there was extremely important. So it's, it's this project, the Latinx project for peer navigation was built from the African American study. And so we really didn't have a lot to go on, but we did have the literature reviews. And they stated that, of course, patients with serious mental illness experience greater comor comorbidities, meaning that they have more physical health challenges, they have more emotional challenges, and these are things that cause them to die earlier than their other counterparts. And also when you add to that uh, minorities, health disparities, ethnic differences, it expands exponentially. So these were a couple of things that we thought about when we thought about the Latinx community, how these health disparities make it worse. And one of the things that we saw was that um, there's a lack of service providers that really understood their family dynamics. So in most instances, we talk a lot about shared decision making. Well, in the Latinx community, they do a lot of family decision making. And so sometimes you'll have to wait if you're a physician until the mother comes or the grandmother comes to make that final decision. And these are, very, these are things that are extremely important to this demographic of people. But also we saw that there is an absence of service providers that know these family dynamics that uh, are accessible to the community at an affordable price. And so if you don't have the competition, you got the high price. And so those were some of the things that we saw that were going on with this particular demographic. So hence we have the peer navigation. These are people with lived experience of mental illness who are currently now living a productive life in recovery. And uh, more than likely they come from the same background. So within our African-American study, they were African-American. In the Latinx study, they were also Latino, okay? Um, specifically what they're trying to do, and we know that in this healthcare environment now, we have a very fragmented system. And you might have a primary care, or you may not, that will refer you somewhere else. And the city of Chicago is an extremely large city. And so getting to the foot doctor or the dentist and knowing where to go and how to get there, we wanted to ensure that they were able to navigate this system and offer the support needed to, to, to promote self-efficacy. Because we knew that it was going to be extremely important for them to be able to take control of their own lives and manage this once the study had ended. Now, the evidence suggests to us that um, through our findings, we found that there was an improvement in health attitudes and self-management, that um, they received more primary care linkage. You know, it's, sometimes it can be very frustrating to get that referral and then follow through 
with that referral, you know? And so we found that that was happening very well. And then the peer services related had um, less hospitalization and inpatient days. Meaning that when you go to the emergency room, if you are really sick, they may keep you. And uh, this, we had the ability to lessen that. Our hypothesis was that the Latinx with serious mental illness assigned to the peer navigator would show greater service use. So they would follow through on those appointments and that the participants in the intervention group, we measured quality of life, recovery, and personal empowerment. This was a randomized control trial. Um, it took place at uh, Trilogy Behavioral Health Services on the north side of Chicago. And um, the intervention was two parts, two conditions. One was integrated care, treatment as usual. The other was integrated care, treatment as usual with the peer navigation services. The outcomes again were recovery, personal empowerment, and quality of life. And we find that to be extremely important that people are living the lives that they desire. So this is a, just a little picture. Um, this is a long time ago. I think I was a less skinny. Let me see. I'm the one right there next to Dr. Corrigan. This was my first ever adventure into research, community-based participatory research. I had just gotten housed two months prior from the shelter. And, uh, and I was looking for something to do. And this was, a, this was what? Divine intervention. This was where I was brought. And we learned about research in a way that I never thought was possible. Here I am thinking I'm just about to complete this survey and get this $50. And uh, it was so different, right? It was a five year study. And I'm like, what? I get paid for five years? You know? So uh, we did create the curriculum and we hired the peer navigators. And from that curriculum, we built upon the Latino. Um, peer navigator program. This is the Latinx community-based participatory research team. The, they're um, researchers from the Illinois Institute of Chicago. We operate uh, within the Illinois Institute of Chicago at Chicago Health Disparity Center, um, headed by Dr. Patrick Corrigan, who does a lot of work in mental health and st the stigma of mental health. And so this is that group of people. And what I can say about this is that we touch a lot of lives with the work that we do. They're involved, they leave the table, they learn, and they're able to take it out to their community. So our recruitment method was that the first team, the African-American team, as well as the Latina team, um, we passed out flyers, we went to churches, we went to health fairs. And what we can honestly say is that recruitment tends to be a little more challenging, specifically when you're introducing someone to something that they really know nothing about. And um, they just, we had to break through a lot of the, the barriers of trust and opening themselves, opening their lives up to something that maybe that we thought to be extremely helpful. Through the screening process, of course, we know they were self-reported diagnosis. And what that means when we say serious mental illness is that your mental illness hinders you from either working full time, achieving your educational goals, or living independently. So that's what we used. And so 51 were excluded because they did not self-report as having a serious mental illness. So again, the conditions was integrated care with peer navigation and then treatment as usual without peer navigation. And we found that um, during the hiring process, we hired four full-time peer navigators with a supervisor. And um, during that interviewing process, we really focused on their current beliefs. Do you believe in self-efficacy? Do you believe in recovery? Do you believe that people can get better and live the lives that they choose to live? And so, and we talked about that and, and the skills that were important to peer navigation services are building a relationship. This is extremely important to be friendly. Okay, so they utilized our manualized uh, program. And throughout this, what we wanted was to see that people were not only scheduling appointments, but they were actually going to the appointments. And then um, 
the, the peer navigator contacted the participant at least once a week, but in some cases, depending upon their needs, they might interact with them a lot more. Whatever that individual needed, they were there to provide that service. Also included in that, we as the researchers called the participants once a week and engaged them in our quant quality quantitative, the numbers. We engaged them. We needed the numbers. We needed to know how many appointments they scheduled, how many they made. And, uh, and that was another way for them to see that this research was extremely important to them. So this coming afterwards, so, so once we got the numbers together and we looked at them and began to analyze them, we saw that major depression was a large part of it, anxiety disorder, bipolar, bipolar depression, but also within those two groups, we saw that the peer navigation team, the people, the participants on that team were a lot older and um, they came they were born in places other than the United States. So we're talking about Mexico, Dominican Republic, and Cuba. Now, the results are that we did see a significant amount of appointments achieved. And when we looked at it, the peer navigators had approximately 6.33 scheduled and uh, 4.55 achieved, whereas the treatment as usual had 3.4 scheduled and maybe 2.15 achieved. So we did see an increase in that. Now, oh, I got two whole minutes. I can do it. Okay, so this work has been published and a large part of it is the qualitative part. We brought the participants in, we interviewed them through our interview guide that I must say was developed by that CBPR team. And what we found was that in peer navigation, that emotional support to increase self-esteem. I, when I think about myself, I was highly isolated, even antisocial in a odd kind of way, you know. Um, I didn't really involve myself within the community structure, and yet, through this peer navigation services, that's what it did. It brought people out of their shells and helped them to see that they could achieve the life that they wanted. But also, we saw that one of the major challenges is that these peer navigators operate from the outside. So things would happen within the agency, changes in procedures that uh, they were not quite aware of because they did not work for the actual agency. And so it was difficult for them to make those transitions and to feel a part of the agency that they were working with. So the LOIs are due, the letters of intent are in due January 31st. Here are some great ideas. Here you go, I did the work for you. Self-reported diagnosis, we could have a structured interviewing process to find out what's going on with the people as far as their physical and mental health conditions are concerned. We didn't take blood pressure, we didn't do blood work. These are some things that maybe other researchers can do. And also we didn't look at the comorbidity of substance use, or the immigration status. We do know that the undocumented participants were extremely cautious as compared to the ones that were United citizens, United States citizens. And uh, also we're thinking that if we could compare peer navigating services to services that the person is not a peer, that would be peer to non-peerness, would be a really good way to research our findings. So that's all I have. I did it in the two minutes. Yeah, I told you I could do it. <laughs> all right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, oh, yes, I, am, I apologize. I was able to bring a patient partner with us. This is someone that is working with us now at the Chicago Health Disparities Center. Julius, can you please step up and uh, come on up to the stage? Hey, you didn't fall. Thank you so much. My mentor usually never forgets. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> in 1984, my life was seemingly at the top. Um, I graduated from Kansas State University with a bachelor's degree in sociology. I qualified for the U.S. Olympic trials in two separate hurdle races. I was ranked in the top 10 for two years in a row and was ranked in the world in the men's low hurdles, and today, still hold the low hurdle record for the men's at Kansas State University, 34 years. Um, wow. But the biggest victory I gotta tell you, as I share this a little bit with you, was that um, at, age, uh, at age 24 is when I did the Olympics and all that stuff. 
but at age 27, I ended up in a Los Angeles County Hospital with the suicide attempt, unbeknownst to me. Someone had uh, saw me hanging by my own noose, and they pulled me down. And then I refused to get treatment and services because I also was a social worker at that time, and I was a track coach, and I was that go-to person, so I didn't want no one to know. So my re remedy was just to move and go back home to Illinois, where I'm from. Um, and so, but what happened was for the next two and a half decades, I had what I know today was untreated bipolar schizoaffective disorder. And some of the uh, experiences that I had came back to me. I had some psychosis, auditory hallucinations. I was not on any type of drugs. I was running from emergency vehicles and hospitals. I thought my family and friends were part of an assassination team plot to kill me. I became homicidal and suicidal and left untreated. That subsequently led to the substance abuse, more suicide attempts in and out of hospitals and jails and prisons as a result of my substance abuse use. Until finally I came to a point where I was at a point was change or die. And that was eight years ago. Um, I uh, was introduced to behavioral mental health care, although I was a social worker, and I was convinced that there's a strong relationship between mental health and addictions. And so I bowed down. I felt that I was a social worker and everyone benefited from me. From me, when I helped them, it's got to work for me. And it did. And so the last four years that I was incarcerated, which was four years ago, in that process, um, I got my associates in addictions. I learned why I couldn't use. And then when I, I, I sought some mental health services, but when upon my release, I attended Trilogy Behavioral Mental Health Care in, in Chicago. And I got a therapist, uh, stress groups, et cetera. I bought into it, and I got to tell you, my whole life has changed. And within about two years, I elevated, got promoted to be on the client advisory committee as a voice to the people, to the administration. And while, it, while I was at one of my meetings, I met Sonia Valentine. <laughs> she, she, her and one of her colleagues came in and they introduced this PCOI project. Um, uh, they had devised this um, inspiring change manual and then also a leadership training that they invited me to. And I said, sure, I'm interested, but I tell you, it took about two weeks to remember to go to it. And she just called me and kept calling me and reached out. And then I came, it was the best decision I've ever made in my life. And so, and I gotta tell you, so since I've been with Pokori, it has empowered me. It, it let me know that my, I, my bad was not, actually I was like doing some research but I wasn't with you nobody, but my bad turned into something good. Uh, Pokori has taught me how to facilitate groups, um, how to recruit uh, the CBRP, CBPR team members, and then recruitment methods for the community base for patients. They also taught me how to, how to deal with uh, accommodations and dual relationships and the power dynamics, right, and handling conflicts. And also, uh, they're in the process of helping me to increase my office skills because I was 20 years behind. Last time I worked, we were using pencils and pens. And so, um, so that's what Corey has done for me. And today is my, uh, my uh, we just completed a, a nine month project um, that uh, African Americans impacting healthcare. And it was a success. And, um, and so I just, wow, I don't even know what to say, but this is my first time here. And I tell you, after all the running I did, this is the biggest victory. And the biggest thing that I, I really enjoy is that the uh, uh, Sonia and her colleagues, they, when they created this manual um, called um, uh, Inspiring Change, it teaches us that the level of playing field is even with the academic researchers and the people with lived experience, even playing field. That gave me so much confidence because on the inside I was wondering how they're going to try to play me. I was in the streets, but I got a degree too, you know, don't forget that. So, yeah, <laughs> but, I gotta t but I gotta tell you, it's, it's just a great opportunity. Um, I've learned so much since I've walked into this door. I've been crying, you know. It's, it's just, this is a beautiful program. And I just, um, just thank, thank you all for hearing me. And um, also, I wanted to mention this before I forget. Um, also, in the process, I've learned that I had some physical problems, like obesity. I had very high cholesterol that was dangerous, I had to use medication to bring it down. I also was diabetic, 
But they told me with diet and exercise and a commitment, today all my levels are down and I lost 22 pounds because I listened to what they said. See, there's a certain type of humility that I picked up, and this humility was this, is that I had to tell myself that I don't know everything. Thank you for listening. Wow, thank you so much for a really inspirational story. Thank you for sharing that. Um, wow, great. It's just great to feel that these things are actually working because that's why we're all in this. Um, our next speaker today is, um, I will introduce, is David Kelly. He, uh, David Kelly oversees the clinical and quality aspects of Pennsylvania's medical assistance programs, which provide health benefits to more than two and a half million recipients. The Office of Medical Assistance Program's recent accomplishments include participation in a multi-payer medical home collaborative, initiating, initiating pay-for-performance programs, and developing a multi-state application for the Medicaid Electronic Health Record Incentive Program. Previously, he was the medical director responsible for utilization and quality management in Pennsylvania for Aetna, and he served as assistant professor and director of clinical quality improvement at the Pennsylvania State Univer University College of Medicine and practiced in multiple clinical settings. Dr. Kelly is board certified in internal medicine and geriatrics. Please go ahead. Thank you. It's really a, a pleasure to be here. I want to thank Corey uh, uh, for being here. And uh, after, it's a tough act to follow. <laughs> the, 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 the beauty of Corey is that it is person patient focused. And that really is, if you don't remember anything else, remember that and remember what the words that you just spoke. Uh, because that's really what it's all about. And being uh, person focused uh, is really, in my mind, the way to go. From my standpoint, in looking at the evidence and the studies that have been presented here, um, I, as a Medicaid medical director, can put into place programs that will start to pay for these types of interventions. And in Pennsylvania, we've been blessed. We have James and, and other leaders like him that have done the research. And we can then, from a policy standpoint, say, you know what, we're going to pay for these models of care. So we're very happy that uh, the model that James described uh, has been disseminated to over 50 clinical sites uh, in Pennsylvania and has really made an impact in those individuals' lives that were being seen in uh, those mental health centers. So that's, and, and the results that we saw uh, around patients getting uh, motivated, getting engaged, understanding, their physical health conditions, uh, and then not just understanding, but actually wanting to do something about it, as you just testified to. I mean, to me, that's the beauty of the evidence. As a policy person, I can go and say, look, we need to be paying for these models of care. Uh, I will say that in Pennsylvania, we very much so advocate for the peer uh, navigator, the peer specialist. We actually have that as a service in our Medicaid program. We recognize the value of having peers, uh, both for mental health, uh, as well as peer recovery specialists uh, when it comes to substance use disorder and moving towards recovery. So uh, from our standpoint, having the evidence that these PCORI studies provide for us allows me to, from a policy standpoint, say, you know what, this really makes sense and we really need to be paying and put uh, payment structures in place so that these models of care can be even uh, further uh, disseminated. I think what's also really powerful, and I heard this from the other speakers, is that you really need, need every community is unique and different. And solutions within each community perhaps do need to be slightly different. Uh, but there are some common things that really need to be looked at. Um, so again, I think the research that, uh, that folks have done has been, is just tremendously helpful in understanding that and understanding the importance of cultural sensitivity, understanding um, that uh, individuals 
the, the medical model of care only addresses so much. There is all of these other uh, social determinants of health. There's the wellness model that was talked about. There's so many other factors that I think are so important in um, making sure that people get the health care that they need. So um, from our standpoint, we're um, very pleased with the work that PCORI's done, the fact that you've committed $250 million to looking at and studying from a person-patient-focused standpoint what's happening in mental health is a huge help for us as we uh, have to justify why we are paying uh, for certain services. We have a limited budget. We're always under the, the guise of, can we cut this, can we cut that? And my job is to take, uh, when there is evidence that, um, that certain things work, my job is to say, you know what, these are the programs we need to advance and we need to, to replicate and disseminate. So I just want to thank Pecori again for the opportunity to be here. Uh, it's just really a blessing to hear the various models that have been, that have demonstrated that they are effective, that get patients motivated, get them engaged in treatment because that's what makes the difference. Um, so I just want to, uh, again, thank Pecori for the opportunity to be here and, and thank the uh, other presenters uh, for all of the hard work that you did and especially the involvement of patients, not only in the study, but actually helping to do the studies. To me, that's just fascinating and, and thanks. Thank you, uh, David, and um, it is really our pleasure to have you, especially at the table, as and hear your payer perspective, because of course in research it often is, well, there's research, there are great results, and then where do they go? And so that's, that's really part of our setup, and we are very happy that you are here to provide that perspective. So um, we do have some time, I know it's late in the day, but we do have some time for questions. Do people have questions? There are microphones um, that you can walk up to and address your question to anyone or everyone. Is it on? Okay, there we go. Um, I'm glad I got the chance to talk to you again, Mr. Kelly. Um, in the opioid, I had a question, but they sort of ran out of time. But you did mention something about uh, bringing law enforcement into the fold and um, uh, because it has to be a paradigm shift from um, punitive to preventive to treatment. And can you share uh, how that dialogue has been uh, with the uh, law enforcement? Sure, thank you. Um, uh, specific to opioids, but also with persistent serious mental illness, we've tried to work with the law enforcement community so that they have a better understanding of the needs of individuals living with persistent serious mental illness. That um, uh, sometimes their behaviors uh, may be um, uh, uh, less predictable, but there needs to be specific training that law enforcement needs to take, undertake so that they're not reacting or overreacting. Specific to opioids, um, we have had a lot of activity with law enforcement. You know, they finally have figured it out that we're not going to arrest our way out of this problem, that they have to be involved. And so we, some of our county uh, and statewide, but some of the county programs, we actually have law enforcement uh, that are going out after someone has had an overdose event to actually go out with a peer uh, to uh, talk to that individual to see if they're willing to get into treatment. Uh, that's a paradigm shift from I'm just going to lock you up and forget about you. And so um, there are several programs that uh, have been implemented by our law enforcement and various counties have had various programs. Uh, so I have really have started to see less stigma from law enforcement, uh, a better understanding of what's happening from both uh, persistent serious mental illness standpoint, but also from a substance use disorder standpoint to try to understand that we're not going to rest our way uh, out of, um, of those issues and we need to have a better, better training and better understanding in how to approach 
individuals living with, with mental health as well as substance use disorder conditions. Hi, Carol Janney, um, Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. And I was really pleased to hear you talk about how do we pay for these services. And I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more. I know Dr. Schuster mentioned it as well as Dr. Kelly. And I, I know Medicaid is a, a maze. So as a researcher, I've just dipped my toe in it and, and I would appreciate some guidance. Sure. So um, we've uh, have used a, a few different value-based payment strategies to encourage providers to implement this service. So uh, we started from the fact that we tried to develop a model that was primarily an enhancement of existing services. So we actually also used Peggy Swarbrick's wellness coaching model and training that she developed uh, to enhance the skill sets of the case managers and peer specialists and some of the clinical staff. So they were already being paid for for their services, but we really tried to enhance their skill set and provide some, a lot of technical assistance and training to them. The cost of the nurse was an incremental cost to the provider. Um, so what we did initially was uh, we just enhanced the uh, rate that they got for case management if they included the nursing service within the case management service. Um, that kind of worked initially, but was kind of cumbersome because, you know, they might get more people in treatment or hire more case managers, so it was, uh, uh, it was kind of, or they might shrink their service, so it was kind of variable. So we went to a, we've gone to a different payment model where they're just able to earn an incentive payment that's the cost of the nurse plus some additional funds as long as they meet certain process and quality metrics uh, tied to uh, having the program in place. So from a Medicaid standpoint, again, uh, James runs one of our behavioral health and physical health managed care companies. So we give them the flexibility to develop some of these payment models. But as a program, we pay for uh, peer specialists uh, as well as uh, targeted case management. I think James' program uh, took those individuals help them be better trained and with having the physical health care nurse and paying for that uh, that's a, one of the things that was different about James's program those individuals I think were now uh, more of, more effective in working with individuals uh, living with serious mental illness and uh, the nurse really uh, allowed those uh, the, the uh, other individuals working with the patients to have a better understanding of their physical health yeah. condition uh, and they were more likely then to go uh, for additional uh, services and recognize that they had physical health conditions. Uh, so uh, we, have, we already had those payment mechanisms in place and then the extra portion was really paying for that nurse uh, to co-locate really, you know, uh, from a physical health standpoint into the mental health center. Uh, so we, we took existing payment structures but we enhanced what was happening. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Go ahead. Good afternoon. <laughs> we'll get this right one of these times. Uh, my name is Dale Fiedler. I'm uh, with SHF uh, Healthcare, and we were fortunate enough to have a three year uh, pipeline to proposal project. And we've seen an example or two this afternoon of kind of patient involvement in the design of a project. And uh, uh, one of the things that was pointed out in our program, while we have not gotten to the study part yet, funded study part, uh, just the process that we had gone through and the utilization of the patient groups, um, the, our psychiatrist who was involved with the uh, project, uh, about halfway through, really you know, noted the advancements in health that in, in mental health that the uh, patients were making and so I just wondered kind of how universal is that and did you have that in your projects 
also, and I mean, it wasn't anything necessarily measured or documented or anything like that, but, but you could kind of tell just kind of from the beginning, patients were very, very, you know, withdraw, you know, uh, you know, really were hesitant to speak very much, and and as 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 the group evolved, and you know, we kind of adopted the together we can make it kind of as our our the name of our uh, uh, group, and, and it really kind of fit everybody kind of involved there, mm -hmm. and and just wondered if that's a kind of a, a wide, mm -hmm. widely uh, uh, a phenomenon that occurs in other projects or other other folks in the room too, maybe if you've. Uh, been involved with that, uh, just kind of curious. And we, we also thought, now while it's really not perhaps a, a uh, PCORI uh, interested in that kind of funding, but maybe some other kind of funding, maybe involving uh, patients like in uh, measuring that involvement in like a quality improvement program or, you know, really where we really value their, you know, input. Mm -hmm. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, I, th I think it's a it's a great question. Um, I'm guessing we've all had similar experiences. Um, you know, we've, uh, on our project, we actually had a co-PI who was a peer specialist at one of the agencies that we were working with and it clearly had an impact uh, on her as well as other people who participated. But even beyond this study, um, we have a number of uh, patient advisory groups, family advisory groups, youth advisory groups, and some have been in place now for 10 years. And you definitely see people progress and develop leadership skills as part of it over time. And they become, fortunately, very outspoken and share their ideas, which you know we wouldn't have otherwise. So our experience with uh, all kinds of stakeholder groups is that the, has really been invaluable. And then um, I can also speak to this. When I initially started with that first community-based participatory research project, um, they saw something in me. I began to learn. And there's something to be said about people who have been out of the educational environment for a very long time, and now their brain cells are really waking up and they're learning things that, um, that they had no idea existed. I know that it was that way for me. And when I develop teams and, and formulate teams, we know that it's going to become a family unit. We're prepared for that. We're prepared to care for each other in a way, even outside of the table. But we also do see that once the light bulb goes off, and they see that they're making a real difference in their own community, there's a sense of purpose that is priceless. And I think that that is what PCORI does. This type of research touches lives. It changes lives. I hadn't worked in 10 years. I started off part-time, and now I'm full-time with a whole new set of stress. But it's okay, <laughs> right? I can keep a job. It's just, it's, it's remarkable. And uh, anyone that has an opportunity to put patients and to work with patients and to engage people in this way, your life will forever be changed also. Thank you. Hi, Charlotte Kaufman. I'm a reviewer and ambassador for PCORI. And uh, just an anecdotal story and then a question. Um, my son Brent, who is 39, uh, has schizoaffective disorder and has not been consistently compliant with oral medications or anything uh, along his journey, pretty much. But um, the last time he was hospitalized, which was about a year and a half ago, the psychiatrist knew him and he said, I'll tell you what, he said, uh, if you'll go into the integrated care clinic and get an Invega shot once a month, then we won't bother you with the other stuff. So for a uh, year and a half, uh, that's what he's been doing. So he's been able to maintain for that length of time. So in this case, they leverage the, the physical care mm -hmm. aspect of it to get him to be compliant. Mm -hmm. So um, my question is, have any of you used the new R program? Are you familiar with that at all? It stands for Nutrition and Exercise for Wellness and Recovery. It comes out of SAMHSA, and it's a short-term peer-led program for 
exercise and nutrition. So I know Trilogy has had that in their agency, but anyway, just you might want to look into it. to that. Uh, yes, Trilogy has had it, and we are now partnering with uh, Trilogy for uh, Behaviors for Healthy Lifestyles program. So they will be involved in a, a new uh, nutrition and physical activity community-based participatory project that we're doing right now in the city of Chicago. So we're very familiar with that project. Yeah, I just wanted to say it sounds like your son's doctor did a great job of figuring out where he was and what was important to him. That's the, the frame we've all talked about, and it sounds like that's a great real life example. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca Chanis. I'm a program associate with PCORI. Um, thank you all for coming and sharing your stories today. It's been really inspiring. We've touched a lot on patient engagement throughout, like from the beginning of the study, but I was wondering if you could speak more about patient engagement prior to the study, not mm -hmm how people act when they're at the table, but actually getting people to the table, because communities that are vulnerable, that face disparities, um, and that may have had prior bad experiences with care or research, you know, it must be really hard to get them to buy in in the first place. Um, and it seems like all of you have done that really successfully. So I was just wondering if you could speak more about those experiences. Hi. <laughs> it's so hard to talk about it now because um, I, just walking into the community mental health center now, I'm like stopped. Everyone wants to know, when are you doing this again? Um, but I really think that, you know, the best thing is word of mouth from other people, um, other people with lived experience, other people who are, are receiving services at, the, um, at those sites. For me, what I did initially was I went to the advisory um, group that you know, for the Connecticut Mental Health Center. I also went to another group um, which takes place at a soup kitchen um, called the Citizens Group, and I talked to the individuals there. So I, I went to places where people go, told them what I was interested in, um, sought their advice, and it really made them feel like they were a part of something, so. It's just easier to do it once you do it, so you almost forget, you know? <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to add, it sounds like what you're talking about really is building trust with the people that you want to work with, and there's no shortcut to that. So, you know, the fact that um, community care had been working with these individuals and agencies for 10 or more years prior to this meant that we'd work with them on a number of uh, strategies to enhance access to services, improve services. We've done lots of work with Pat Deegan to implement recovery-focused models of care. So they knew us. So then it was, it, it didn't mean that they would accept necessarily what we said without talking it through, but it meant they'd at least have a conversation with us. And then also, um, we lead by example. And so they see us as patients and they see how our lives have changed and they wanna be a part of that and just being encouraging and supportive. So in many instances, we'll say to them, you're not gonna be a research participant here. So it's not just one survey or one focus group, you're going to be our partner. We're going to sit at the table and develop a curriculum or, or develop a training program and it's gonna take some time. This is over the course of two years, you're going to continually be involved. Are you willing to commit the time? And we have to say that over and over again, but it's well worth it because eventually it really clicks. And so I do that prior to the project um, all the time because I still get services. And so also when I walk into the resource center, they're like, Sonia, win the next one, you know? and. Um, and we're always telling them about the proposals we put out and what we're going to be doing and what we look forward to maybe getting funded. And so our eyes are always open for those relationships. Hello, my name is Patrick G. Um, I'm here as a, a Corey ambassador, as well as a um, member of the American um, Association of Kidney Patients. 
Um, I had a kidney transplant um, April of last year, and you all are touching on something um, that is running rampant in the kidney community, um, which is mental health, because um, I think there were studies done that were stating that um, I think after so many years on dialysis, um, a lot of patients suffer from PTSD. But my actual question is directed for this young man right here, but I'm going to throw a nugget to you all. <laughs> And I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but you shouldn't have gave a powerful testimony like that because it kind of hit home. <laughs> I retired 20 years in DOC. If you, I guess my question to you, and this is a two-part question, to you in a time that you were incarcerated, because again, doing dialysis, and I did peritoneal dialysis, which I was at home. I would do 10 and a half hours a day, seven days a week. So that's 73.5 hours a week. Multiply that by a month, the year, and I can't get that time back. But it was like house arrest because you couldn't go nowhere. I'm hooked up to a machine. I've seen what offenders went through in prison. And I've also seen the maladjustment they had to deal with on the outside once they got released because there are no services that want to deal with folks that have that type of past. If you had one wish that you would like to see in adult and juvenile facilities pertaining to mental health, what would it be? And would this be a project that you all, or do you think Bacori would consider trying to get corrections to buy into? Because there was already a question on um, law enforcement. Mm -hmm. But what you see in the streets is totally different than what you see in the prisons. So. I'm sorry. We pulled your name out of a database system. We look for those who have years of hospitalizations and incarceration. <laughs> Can we talk to you? That was that was the turning point right there. Okay. Because then they started to open me up to some things to take a, to take an introspective look at myself. They gave me more information. There was there was a, for years I've always felt like and knew. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But now I say, if you lead a horse to water long enough, sooner or later, it's going to start drinking. <laughs> yeah, so I would say jail outreach programs. Okay. That's good. Mm -hmm. Now, for you, do you think this is something that we could get um, corrections to kind of take a look at? Because the, the thing is, in a lot of states, like I'm from the state of Virginia, so the first thing that gets cut is programs. Yet and still, they want folks to come out better than what they went in. And when I started working, there was a philosophy. Um, there's no such thing as rehabilitation unless one rehabilitates himself. And even the public expects that in some retrospect with people that haven't been incarcerated in dealing with mental health. So I was just wondering if this was something that could be considered um, mm -hmm. being at the state of mental health um, mm -hmm. in this country. Yeah, from a Bacori so perspective, um, mm -hmm. Bacori will consider any study that, that, um, that compares what works best for whom. So in a, in a prison setting, 
that would be perfectly fine. The problem is we would expect, I mean, it's not a problem, but it kind of puts the work outside of <laughs> PCORI. We expect people to come to us with, that, with the plan and a number of the pieces in place. So if you can connect people at the table here to people in that setting, et cetera, then, yeah. and you develop a plan to then please bring it to us, yes. And also, I'd like to say that um, I'm pleased to say that we have just been funded for um, uh, post-incarceration, mental illness, re-entry into the community for health services. So we're going to start uh, another engagement award uh, in the beginning of December. And so I'm really happy to say that we are now currently working in that field. So more news to come. <laughs> awesome. Go ahead. Sure, uh, Joyce Frieden from MedPage today. Um, uh, I am curious about kind of the scalabilities of all these programs because they seem very labor intensive and maybe very monetary intensive. And so I'm just wondering, particularly the gentleman from the Pennsylvania uh, Public Welfare Department, you know, it, is this something that, that uh, people could envision being uh, more widespread? these types of programs. So again, I think the, the easy answer is yes. And uh, at least in the state of Pennsylvania, we've already made that commitment. Uh, uh, in our state plan, we, we do pay for peer, peer specialists. We'd like to really see them use as effectively as possible. We pay for targeted case management. We'd like to see some of those services that are redesigned so that they're even more effective so that it can be even more widely disseminated. So we've already had a fair amount of dissemination. Um, I know that we have also made a commitment um, to a program we call community-based care management or where we, working with our managed care plans, we, I'll say, target funds that are really geared towards these types of programs that need to be done in the community. Uh, we really like to see the use of uh, peers, community health workers, uh, doulas for pregnant women. We really feel that there is just an increasing uh, set of evidence that says these strategies work. So we've already made that commitment. We're already working with our managed care plans and um, we, we really plan to sustain that. I have a follow-up question for that. Um, David, you had also mentioned that, you, um, th that you're aware that these programs may need to be um, adapted to some extent for different communities. And it made me wonder how flexible payments are. So in terms of the evidence, if there's, is, if there's evidence for one particular program with that generalized to adapted programs for different communities? So I think the interventions are adaptable. Um, the, the payment models uh, can also be somewhat flexible and within Pennsylvania, we do that through our managed care companies and they have, because they work within a waiver, they have the flexibility to do different payment models. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, from our standpoint, we like, the fact that a managed care plan can implement a program, let's say in Pittsburgh, but if they're in rural Pennsylvania, that program has to look very, it has to be different. Um, and and the, the funding may need to be somewhat different. Uh, and the, the resources you know, out in those rural areas perhaps need to be different. Uh, you have to take into you know, travel time and, and um, other factors. So. That's why within managed care, there is the flexibility for our managed care plans to pay teams differently or to structure things differently. But the evidence and of the interventions, uh, we, we feel it can be uh, uh, disseminated and that uh, from our standpoint, it may not be the exact same model, but if there's a lot of fidelity in the model, uh, with perhaps some minor tweaking, we're okay with that. 
uh, and we have the flexibility, our managed care plans have the flexibility to pay for slightly different models. Thank you. Yeah, I, ju I just wanted to add, we've actually replicated this model now at 50 community-based mental health agencies across the state. Um, and we actually did some post hoc analysis uh, with a comparison group that suggested actually the model saved money as well, even though that wasn't the intent. But that having, you know, our hypothesis is that having additional nurse involved, really helping uh, really people, the case managers and peers think about the services they were delivering around both behavioral health and physical health services uh, was a really effective use of resources. I had a question. Um, does Pori have any uh, any sort of study, studies specifically dealing with incarcerated or inmate populations? Um, yes, we do. We have um, uh, a, one study that I know is running currently, where um, patients with opioid use disorder are um, receiving injectable naltrexone before they are released versus, I think the comparison is before they are released versus immediately after. But I, but I don't want to be quoted on that specific comparison, but I know it's, an, it's that population. Hello, my name is Tawanda Darton. I am a provider with Empowering Youth for Positive Change. My question is, I see a lot in the school system um, children with mental health illnesses. Um, I see the school to prison pipeline, and it, most of you know Virginia is the number one state with the school to push out. Has Pecori developed a program where mental health needs can be met in a school setting, or to make sure that educators knows what those behaviors look like with those di disabilities? We are in rural areas. I'm talking mm -hmm. about two hours away to get to a psychiatrist, two hours away to get to a psychologist. If you got someone. Uh, we have a cutter two hours away to get them stabilized. Have PCOR done any data or have any research to help us as a provider? Because we know Medicaid funding has been cut. Um, providers only can bill for so many services with the medallion expansion. It has affected mm -hmm. a lot of our children that's in the school, so now they're getting suspended. The behaviors are increasing. Um, suicide has went on the rise. I mean, it's the highest it's ever been. Kids bringing guns to school, they're killing kids. I want to know what, what is Pecora doing for the children, the adolescents? Um, so we have just, uh, uh, there's a study that is looking at um, different ways of addressing that problem. And it's in a number of schools, not in a rural area, but in Baltimore. I live in Baltimore and I know that about the problems in the, this is in, a, right. in middle schools, I believe, where um, the intervention is uh, twofold. It is um, a curriculum that is being implemented in the schools that the kids are exposed to for three years, which teaches um, about mental health and what to do with different mental health problems. So it reduce, it, the intent is that it reduces stigma um, and just educates you know, mental health literacy. And then in addition to that, when kids um, need behavioral health services, there um, is not just the connection with the, um, between the kid and the, and the person in the school who takes care of these things, but there is an outreach to the family and there are, um, uh, so a real engagement program for those specific kids, but all the kids get the, get the education. So that is one example of a study that, that is looking at that specifically. We don't, there are no results yet, so, um, okay. but it's in the works. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions? If not, then I want to thank the panel, um, each and every one of you for being here.